Hello, it's Scott Manley here. Now, with the forthcoming release of Kerbal Space Program 1.2, many of you are wondering about the new ComNet feature and have been asking questions about how it behaves, so I want to cover that in this video. The very first thing that I got asked is, can you just disable the whole thing and never worry about it? And of course, yes you can. If you're starting a new career mode game, go into your difficulty options and just disable Enable ComNet, and you'll be fine. There are also advanced options to adjust the ranges of the dishes and the DSN, the Deep Space Network. You can adjust how uh, atmosphere and planets occlude things. You can disable the extra ground stations if you want it harder. You can make re-entry trigger a blackout due to the re-entry plasma. And you can disable even the partial control if you don't think the game is tough enough. But I'm just going to leave the default options here and of course accept this and start this. Now, if you've started a game already and you want to change the options, you probably, you may not know this, but if you go into settings, right at the very top you have the difficulty options and in there that's where you would disable or enable the comm network. If you've got a game that's running already and you want to continue with it, that's where you would change those settings. Okay, now let's talk about transmission range. You're obviously going to want your antennas to be within range and the thing that they want to be in range of is the tracking station, obviously. So by default in a career mode, the lowest level tracking station has a max DSN power. DSN is obviously the deep space network. It uh, corresponds to 2 billion. And that is, it's kind of a range, but it's a little more complicated than that. If we upgrade it, we get it to 50 billion and the highest level version is 250 billion. Now, we pair that off with antennas, and everything has antennas, so if you go into the R&D lab and right-click, you'll see the data transmitter section tells you that uh, the antenna type is internal. Everything that has a control capability has a 5K antenna. But to actually compute the range, what you do is you take that 5K and you multiply it by the 2 billion for the level 1 DSN, and then you take the square root of that. So the default capsule with the base DSN will only have a 3,160 kilometer range. As you upgrade, you go through 15,000 kilometers and even 35,000 kilometers. So with the highest level DSN, you should be able to go to the moon, but you're not going to be able to talk to your talk to base when you're, say, at Minmus. Now, if we go down the tech tree, we can see uh, an, an antenna here. Right-clicking on this, it shows that the antenna range is 500k, and as you would expect, because we're taking a square root here, all of the ranges are 10 times more than the 5k antenna. And going all the way down the tech tree, we find, uh, let me see if we can find one. There we go. We have a relay antenna with a range of 100 gigs, and this one goes all the way out to 158 gigameters range. Now, there's an extra wrinkle in the form of multiple antennas. If you right-click on the antenna, it'll tell you the antenna range is combinable. And out at this distance, I have, you know, 1% uh, signal strength. And of course, by deploying extra antennas, I will get myself into range. But if you remember the formula, it takes the square root of things. So to actually double the range, you need four times the antenna. So that's something to know because, of course, it helps you at the low end uh, when you're starting out early in the game when you don't have the tech. But uh, it's better to just upgrade the tech and use bigger and bigger antenna. Okay, so in case you've forgotten how big the Kerbin system, what kind of ranges do you need? Well, the moon is 11,000 kilometers away, uh, so you can actually get there with either the basic antenna and a non-upgraded tracking station, but realistically, by the time you're going to the moon, you'll probably have upgraded your tracking station at least one level. Uh, and that should actually cover you all the way out to Minmus. Now, going further out, the closest that Eve gets is about 3 million kilometers, although the furthest it could get is 18. Uh, then Moho can be 8. Duna gets a clo as close as about uh, 7. So, you know, you're going to... By the time you're exploring the inner solar system, you're probably going to have seriously upgraded to the third level tracking station. And at that point, you are just going for the biggest antenna that matches your requirements. Um, 
Elu is all the way out at 126. Well, it's actually out at 113, but when you account for the orbit of Kerbin, it could be as far away as 126 or as close as 100. Either way, the largest antenna will work for you. Now, in picking an antenna, you don't just consider the range. There's other important uh, criteria, let's say. So, if you look at the data transmitter section, the info box here, it says the antenna type is direct. This means that it can talk to Kerbin directly, but it is not able to relay signals. If you look here at the relay antenna, it is able to relay signals. That means that it can sit in between uh, two other spacecraft and pass the data forwards onto Kerbin. This is very useful if you're, say, building a satellite network. It's going to be required if you're wanting to talk to another spacecraft on the dark side of a planet. So yeah, make sure you have a relay antenna if you are going to be building a communication spacecraft. The other thing that's pretty important is that the deployable antenna are, will all rip off if you try to fly through the atmosphere with them deployed. So if you're having a spacecraft which is supposed to collect and transmit data, say, while descending through an atmosphere, you do not want to have the deployable kind. You want to have the fixed kind. And the fixed kind will tend to be a little heavier. So the Communitron 16, uh, when deployed, will get torn off, but the slightly heavier 16S is a, you know, it's a fixed uh, antenna like this one on the side here. Pretty much the same stats, but it won't get torn off during descent. It may burn off due to excessive heating, but that's a whole other different kind of design problem. So the relay antenna are absolutely required if you are building communication satellites. Make sure you don't forget that. Transmission power is now actually important in how much science you get back. So if I log the pressure data here, it says if I transmit with my 84% uh, strength, I'm going to get 15.8 science back. But if I reset and, of course, use the magic cheat here to move myself out a little, I'm now 32,000 up. If I log the pressure data again, I now only get 9.1. So get your signal strength as high as possible if you want to maximize the amount of science you're getting from spacecraft which are probes of course you can pair them up with relay satellites and everything else to make sure you maximize your signal strength okay so now there are some changes to spacecraft uh, if you are a crewed spacecraft now in this one we have an engineer a scientist and a scientist and they are not pilots so they cannot create maneuvers However, if we just run time forward a little, we get a connection all the way back to Kerbin, and they can radio the boys in the lab and say, hey, how do we fly this darn thing? And you will get your maneuver node capabilities back. Pilots can always place maneuver nodes, so they don't have to worry about that. They are completely independent, and indeed they gain some other skills. This spacecraft is a dinky little thing, it has a tiny antenna, and it's orbiting ELU, so there is no way that it can ever talk home. But in orbit, I have something called my mothership, and, so, and if I don't set it on target, if I switch to it, you will find that it is Jebediah Kerman sitting in, well, a nuclear-powered spacecraft that is a very long way from home. Now, if I deploy these antenna, this will be able to act as a control spacecraft for the other one. Now, it's not just that we have Jebediah Kerman here. What's really important is the probe core. So, so this uh, two and a half meter and the 1.25 meter cores, basically the devs thought that there wasn't enough to differentiate them from regular probe cores. So having these on spacecraft now makes them very like powerful nexuses of control. Nexuses, nexi. So if I now go back to my spacecraft, I should be able to fly this correctly with Jebediah providing full control. Yeah, we get signal strength of 94% and remote control is here. So yeah, I can throttle up the engines and fire and then you will probably fall onto the planet and kill myself. But we have full control here. So I can adjust my, uh, I can use the WASD keys to control it. If you do not have a control link, you can still control the spacecraft. You just can't use the WASD keys. You can only use the 
uh, the stability control and the prograde markers. Also, you can't adjust throttle, but you can kind of get around throttle adjusting through the magic of just tweaking your thrust value. I'm just going to drop this thing onto the surface because it's really easy. So, kind of important to note that even although you can perform the remote control using a pilot on uh, there, there's no way to get the data back. So, Jebediah would still have to have a full-on transmitter if you wanted to get the scientific data back. So, it's kind of of very niche use. All the same, it's a, new ni a nice new feature to have. So, yes. Having brought a spacecraft out for the task, we now have a comm network here. Now, and you can actually click this little button here to adjust how the network is viewed. For example, you can see the lander now here uh, with a very, very, very faint connection. And the mothership has a much stronger connection because it has the big antenna. And then you can actually see the full comm network here. So if we switch over to the lander now, we should be able to transmit the data back to Kerbin. Here we go, we've got the wobbling spacecraft logging the seismic data and the data starts transmitting. Of course, this thing <laughs> may have some trouble actually getting all the data out. It's entirely possible this thing will run out of electrical charge before it's completed transmitting all of the experiments. And therein lies another thing you might have to deal with. Because of the way transmissions work now, it's entirely possible, at least in this version, that uh, you will not be able to transmit all the data back. Now, if you take your antenna and you say transmit data, it'll basically start transmitting all the data on the spacecraft from all the different experiments. For example, that's, uh, well, that, I'm not sure what that is, but that's some experiment and we run out of power. And what it does is it rewinds that. So, of course, we can let the electric charge build up and somewhere in here there's an experiment which hasn't transmitted so we've got that we have uh, we've transmitted the thermometer we've transmitted the uh, barometer which is of course completely not surprising since we're not actually in an atmosphere but the gravmax negative gravioli debt uh, system I just can't transmit it every time I try to transmit it gonna run out of data and this is at 100% sig well it's a 99% signal strength that's close enough to 100% for me look uh, the way we have to deal with this is you have to modify your antenna so if you just turn off require complete it now says allow partial and that will transmit everything that you can so review the data and transmit and what will happen is if we look at this it's going to be, say, uploading data, uploading data. Once we run out of power, it'll say the charge. It'll basically show how much electric charge it has built up before it transmits. So it's basically checking every fraction of a second. So eventually you will get through the data. That's kind of an important thing to know if you're used to transmitting data back. Okay, so that's my kind of quick overview of how the remote systems work. And honestly, you shouldn't need to worry too much about it. You don't need to put your spacecraft into perfect kerbostationary orbits because the pointing and everything is handled for you. The reason why real space, why we put spacecraft into geostationary orbits is because you don't want to have tracking hardware on every single personal satellite dish so you can watch Sky TV. No, uh, you put them in geostationary network uh, orbits orbit and it sits right there and you can have a dumb dish you don't need to worry about that you can just throw spacecraft out into whatever orbit just keep sending them out into space and they will handle all the relaying for you magically uh, you don't need to worry about the Kerbal direct control it's fun but it's almost always going to be better just to have a big relay satellite. I'm sure there'll be a niche use for it and I'm sure great things will happen. But we will see them happening when Kerbal Space Program 1.2 is finally released. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe.